We are uh, back in 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18. So uh, last week we started looking at um, Elijah. You know, uh, a couple of weeks ago we looked at uh, God's faithfulness in the life of Elijah. And then last week we started looking at uh, the faithfulness of Elijah to God. Um, as we said, you know, God's going to be faithful regardless. Uh, God, God can be trusted. God can be uh, counted on. There, there's nothing that, that God's ever going to say he's going to do that he's not going to do. We can hold God at his word. The question is, can God hold us to our word? You know, are we faithful to him? The more faithful we are to God, the more we see his faithfulness in our lives. Again, he's always faithful. He's always there. He's always providing but when we are faithful to serve him and we are faithful to do what he has called us to do, then we see his hand, we see his protection, we see his provision. And so that's what we began looking at in the life of Elijah. You know, first all, uh, God's faithfulness and then Elijah reciprocating that faithfulness, if you will, to say, well, yes, I'll be faithful to God. I'll serve God. And so we began looking at this last week and and we saw several areas of, of faithfulness in, in Elijah's life. But as we, as we looked at this, you know, we, we've come through the drought. Uh, Elijah prophesied to Ahab that there'd be uh, what turned out to be three and a half years of drought and dealing with these wicked kings and, and now Ahab and Jezebel on the scene. So last week we saw uh, Elijah's return. So he comes back to, uh, back to Ahab from Zarephath. He returns to the city, he returns to the kingdom after God has sent him to a place of protection, if you will, a separation to keep him safe from maybe the, uh, the backlash of his prophecy and pointing his finger at the king and accusing him of being the cause of everything. So we see the return and then also last week we saw the rebuke because as we know, when Elijah returned, what was the first thing that he did? That he did? Well, he went to King Ahab and rebuked him again. <laughs> Ahab said, are you he that troubles Israel? That's no, not me, buddy. It's you and your wicked wife. You're the ones that are troubling Israel. And he immediately goes right back to the rebuke and right back to telling him that, that he's the cause of all of Israel's problems. But not only that, he calls an assembly and then he rebukes all of Israel. So we see the return, we see the rebuke, and then uh, last week we also looked at the request that Elijah had. So after he returns, he says, you bring me all of your prophets. You bring me all the prophets of Baal, and, and we're going to have a little challenge. We're going to have a little contest. And we're going to find out whose God is the true God of Israel. And we're going to build these altars, and whichever God answers the call by fire, then that God is the one true God. And so what an amazing contest, if you will. And, and we saw not only the request, but we saw the response as the prophets of Baal said, sure. You know, what did we say last week? You know, people that, that follow false gods and false religions, they're just as, as serious and just as dogmatic, if you will, about their beliefs as we are ours. You know, we believe that we serve the true God because we have the Bible that tells us so. And God has proven himself time and time and time again. Well, these prophets of Baal, they believe their God. They believe that they have the right God. So they were more than willing to prove it. And we all know what happened. So, I mean, just amazing how we see this, this prophet, this man of God, who's just willing to do whatever wherever, whenever God says. You know, God, you want to send me to Zarephath? Okay, it's over 100 miles away, but I'll go, right? You want this widow woman to take care of me? Well, she's about to die. Her son's about to die. They don't have anything to eat, but okay. You want the ravens to feed me? Yeah, sure, why not? I mean, we just see how God provided for him, and so Elijah said, I see your provision. I see your, your, your promises in my life. I, I see everything you're doing for me. I've got no reason to question my God. So he's up for the challenge. The prophets of Baal are up for the challenge. And what an amazing picture. And so today we're going to continue in this. And so the first thing that we see here 
is, of course, the result. So back in 1 Kings chapter 18, we see the results of this challenge as we begin in verse number 38. Now notice this. Verse 38 says, so Elijah has called on God. He's mocked the prophets of Baal. All of that's taken place. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Now, th this is really amazing to me because oftentimes we say, Elijah, he's the man that called fire from heaven. And, and I understand the wordage. I mean, I've said that myself. But in reality, Elijah did not call fire from heaven. Elijah prayed. Simply, he prayed. Elijah prayed and God answered his prayer. What was the challenge to the prophets of Baal? We're going to build this altar. We're going to put a bowl on this altar. And we're going to call on our God. And whoever's God answers by fire will be the one true God of Israel. And so as we know the story. The prophets of Baal, they cried all morning. They cried all afternoon and nothing happened. He mocks them. Hey, maybe he's asleep. Maybe you should cry louder. Maybe he's on a trip. He can't hear you. You know, it's just, it just funny how he's just mocking them. And they begin cutting themselves. And this goes on all the way into the evening and no answer from Baal. Why? Because Baal's a false god. Pretty simple. So then it's Elijah's turn. Now, I, as I picture this in my mind, you know, I, I kind of I say all the time I have kind of an over, overactive imagination. But I can picture these prophets of Baal. They start in the morning. They start their sacrifice. They start their praying. They start their rituals, and they go through this. The Bible lays it out from morning to noon, from noon until evening. I mean, just all day long, and nothing is happening. So when the Bible tells us, as we looked at last week, it's now time for the evening sacrifice, which is a normal time. We're all going to gather for the sacrifice. It's Elijah's turn. He steps up to bat, so to speak. It's the time of the evening sacrifice. Elijah prays. Boom. I mean, that's how I picture it. I, I don't know if it was five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. But Elijah comes to his altar. You, you remember what he tells the men. You know, take water. You know, you put the bullock on the altar. Dig a trench. Fill that with water. And he does this three times. He just saturates that wood. I mean, you all know if you've ever been camping or if you ever tried to start a fire, you don't want wet wood. So he's purposely dousing this wood with water and everything. He's covering everything with water. I mean, he doesn't just want to prove God. He wants to double prove God. You know, you're going to see the power of my God when this happens. So he's setting the stage. And so as he, he sets this up and he, he puts all this water on the sacrifice, water on the altar, water on the wood, and everybody's probably just thinking, what is wrong with you? And then he prays. And the Bible says that God answered with fire from heaven. <laughs> now, I, I, I pray that when we get to heaven, we get to see this. I mean, you ever think about that when you read your Bible and think, man, when I, I want to see that, I want to see that on the jumbotron, you know, however God's going to do it. I want, to see th I want to see the parting of the Red Sea. I want to see uh, Noah's flood. I, I want to see all of this, but I want to see, how did God send fire from heaven? Was it a lightning bolt? Was it a giant match? You know, <laughs> I, mean, I date myself. Was it a Zippo lighter? You know, <laughs> how did God do this? But could you imagine standing there and watching? as this fire literally comes out of the sky. You know, when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he led them at night by a pillar of fire. The Bible says that God is a consuming fire. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into the furnace, where was, where was Jesus? In the fire, with them. I mean, just amazing how fire is associated with our God. A powerful, consuming fire. God. But, but notice this. Notice what it says here in this verse again. 
Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to picture this. Have you ever been camping and you build a fire? Sometimes if you build that, you know, if you're an old Boy Scout troop, you know, you build the, the rock ring around your fire so the fire doesn't get out and you keep that safe. Well, I mean... Has your fire ever gotten so hot that those rocks get hot? But they don't get consumed. I mean, think about how powerful this fire is that it consumed even the rocks. I mean, there's nothing left here. There's no water left. There's no sacrifice left. There's no rock left. There's no wood left. There's no dust. God's fire consumed everything. This was the result of one man's prayer. Are, are you getting that? He did not call fire from heaven. He called on his God to answer his prayer. And God answered his prayer. Do you know we serve the same God? And whatever it is that's in our lives that's got us upset, got us concerned, got us worried, got us fretting all the time. God can consume that just like he consumed these rocks and this wood and this sacrifice. God can answer when we call, and he will, because we serve the same God. And Elijah was faithful to call on his God because he knew without a shadow of a doubt, Baal's a false God. My God is the one true God. Watch him answer. What an amazing picture of faithfulness. There's not a doubt in his mind. He's not wondering, well, you know, eh, is he really going to hear me? Will he, really, will he really answer? We don't see that in Elijah. <laughs> God, let all Israel know that you are the one true God. Boom! I mean, that's how I picture it. <laughs> because that's kind of how the Bible lays it out, isn't it? Look at verse 39. Verse 39, and when all the people saw it, notice this, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. <laughs> you know, I don't know how many people are in this kingdom at the time, you know, because of the divided kingdom. But, I mean, I would dare say there are you know, maybe a million people. And they're all gathered together and they all see this and they all see this fire fall out of heaven and they see this sacrifice get consumed and the rocks get consumed and the result is all of Israel says, Elijah's God. He's our God. He's the one true God. He is the one that we need. You see this? I mean, that quick, their hearts are changed. Their minds is changed. But now, here's my question. How many times in the history of Israel does this have to happen? <laughs> I mean, seriously. From day one. When, when, when they started serving God, it seemed like, Squirrel. Right? I mean, hey, hey, Moses, lead my children out of bondage. Oh, we want to stay in Egypt because there's garlic and onions. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Well, let's see. I want to serve God who's going to provide all my needs or I can have garlic and onions. I, I just, I don't understand. And then everything that they saw as God led them out, you know, uh, God provides manna, this, this miracle meal that, that just appeared in the morning. And the Bible says, like the hoarfrost. It's like, where did this come from? It came from God. Well, then manna's not enough. Well, we want meat. Okay, well, you got meat. You know? <laughs> so much quail that it's just coming out your ears. Oh, we, need, we don't have any water. Well, we'll get water from a rock. You know, I mean, come on. How many times does God have to do this? And they still turn to false gods. 
The minute things start getting better, the minute things start going their way, they realize, well, maybe I don't need God so much, and maybe I could go do my own thing, and maybe this other God is okay. And we see this over and over and over in Scripture, and we scratch our heads and go, why do they do this? But we do the same thing. Right? We'll condemn them very quickly. Look at all this. You got, oh, look how God proved himself to you and you're still chasing other gods. Hasn't God proved himself to us over and over, time and time again? Yet we're still fearful. We still doubt. We still question. You know, I, you know maybe God answers other people's prayers, but is he really going to answer my prayer? Yes. When you're faithful, he answers. Now, again, as I said, he's always faithful. But it's the difference between thinking of our children. If you have multiple children and you know you have one child that's always obedient, Lord, give us those children. You know, <laughs> always obedient, always follows the rules, always does what they're told. It's real easy to lavish that child with blessings, isn't it? It's real easy to fellowship with them and have a good time with them and enjoy their company. But you get that one rebellious kid that just doesn't want to listen, has to do things his way, is just bent to their own will, and the whole house feels it, right? Well, you want to bless them in a different way. They still have the benefit of being a family member. They still have the benefit of living in the house, getting the food and everything else, but, you know, I mean... You don't want to bless them with good things. You just want to provide what they need to survive, right? And sometimes you don't even want to do that. <laughs> I just want to end you right now. That's how we are with God. When we're obedient, when we're faithful, when we're walking close with him, he showers us with blessings. But when we're disobedient, we still get provided for because he's faithful, but he's not going to give us the blessings that he could be giving us were we faithful like Elijah. Do you see this? The children of Israel are, are learning this lesson over and over and over, just as we learn it sometimes daily. You know, we, we have things that pop up in our lives that are difficult, whether they're health issues, financial issues, family issues. You know, those, those things will consume us if we allow them to. But if we will turn and give those things to God and allow Him to deal with them and watch Him provide, we can see that fire fall from heaven and consume our problems. Yes, sir? I don't know why why the uh, Jewish people kept needing to be reassured. If the Bible at the very first time, yeah. okay, we learned it, right? we wouldn't understand True. that we go, we're not that way. So because we are the same as them, we have the hope that, that they have. Sure. So they had to do that for our benefit. And, and isn't that what Pastor was talking about? Uh, is it the Wednesday night? No. Sunday nights, he's talking about, you know, these things were for our examples. Mm -hmm. So if we had not seen the faithfulness of God, even to disobedient Israel, then we would not be able to see that he's going to be faithful to us, even though we're disobedient. That doesn't mean we should run out and be disobedient. Because he's, not only is he faithful, but he blesses us abundantly when we are faithful. And so, yes, you know, it is for our, our learning, our example, so that we can see how God continued to come back to them. How many times did he want to destroy them? He wanted to end Israel. And Moses would have to step in and say, no, oh, wait a minute, God. <laughs> and, you know, not that he's trying to convince God, but I think, you know, God was trying to allow Israel to see how serious this is, to be faithful, right? Look at verse 40. And verse 40 says, And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. 
So another result that we see here, not only with the result of, of Elijah's prayer being answered by fire falling from heaven and all, everything consumed, the result of all of Israel proclaiming that God is the one true God, but now another result that we see here is that all the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, were slaughtered by Elijah. As if to say, let's put an end to this nonsense right now. So their, their, their false prophets were gone. They, he ended that. But here's what we need to understand, and this is important that we understand this. He may have been able to slaughter those prophets and end the worship, but he was not able to end the effect that they had on the people, the, the baggage, so to speak. Yeah, the mindset, that's good. But think about this. When we come to Christ, think about when you were saved. Now, when I think about my life, I had a lot of what we call baggage. You know, you, I've heard, you, you all have heard my testimony several times. You know, drugs, alcohol, filthy mouth, filthy lifestyle. I mean, just not a very good person, not a kind person. But when God gets a hold of your heart, does that mean that the minute I get saved, all those things are gone, and now I'm a miraculous, righteous person, and I'm holy, and I never do anything wrong again? Boy, I wish that were true. I still have the baggage. And I still have to purge those things out of my life. With His help, with Scripture, with guidance, God can remove those things. So Israel is still going to have to deal with this. In other words, there are still consequences to their actions that they're going to have to deal with. Do you remember David when he, when he uh, had that adulterous affair with Bathsheba and she got pregnant, right? And so David tried to cover it up. He tried to hide it. He tried to do everything in his power to make it look like it was Uriah's baby and, and that just never happened. Well, what did God do? When David poured his heart out to God and he said, God, forgive me, I've wronged you, I've sinned, and just laid his heart out to God, God forgave him. God restored him, but there were still consequences, weren't there? There were consequences in David's family. His, his sons rebelled against him, and the baby had to die. So we've got to understand that just because we get forgiven and just because uh, God has taken care of us, it doesn't mean there aren't consequences to our actions. So Israel's still going to have to do this, and, and so there's a lot of undoing of the wrong that's going to have to take place. Okay, so that leads us to the final truth that we see here in Elijah. Not only do we see the result him praying to God, we also see finally what everyone's been waiting for, the rain. Look at this in verse 41. Verse 41 says, And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. Now, look at, look at this. Hold, so, Three and a half years, there's been no rain. And what did Ahab tell Elijah at the beginning? Until I say there will be no rain, there will be no rain. Again, not boasting of himself, not proclaiming to have power or authority over the weather, but proclaiming the word of God that came to him and came through him. All right, I'm God's mouthpiece at the moment. What God says goes. So now he comes to Ahab, after all of this has taken place, the prophets of Baal is, have been killed, the fire falls from heaven, everybody's proclaiming a revival, if you will, and he comes to Ahab and he says, by the way, Ahab, your prophets are dead. Oh, what's that I hear? <laughs> it sounds like rain. You better get up. Get up and eat and drink. What's he saying here? It's time to celebrate. Now, now, I want you to get this picture because everything could have changed right here for Israel. If Ahab would have just taken the bait, so to speak, Elijah's giving him an opportunity here. 
Ahab, get up, eat and drink. Essentially what he's saying is give praise to God. The people of Israel have proclaimed that God is the one true God. Baal is a false God. I've just slain all of his prophets. Now let's give praise to God. It's about to rain. You see what he's saying here? So that it's time for a change, Ahab. It's time to turn this thing around. Unfortunately, Ahab doesn't take the bait. So, look at verse 43. And said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass on the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. So now he says to his servant, he says, Now I want you to go out and look at the sea and tell me what, what, you, what you see out there. And he, he does this seven times. Now we could go back and say, Well, you know, seven's a number of perfection. You know, God's number of completion. And, and, and that's fine. But what we see here is Elijah faithful to pray and saying, God, you said it's time for rain. You told me to tell Ahab it's time for rain. We need some rain, right? You see this. So he's praying this whole time. Go again, go again, go again, go again. What do you see? Well, I see a little cloud. It looks like a man's hand. He said, you better go tell Ahab he needs to get moving. If he doesn't get moving, his chariot's going to get stuck in the mud. You see, this is what he's saying, essentially. And, and so he says, it's time. I see a little cloud. He says, you go tell Ahab, he better get up and he better get moving. Now notice verse 45. <laughs> and it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds. How long has it been? Three and a half years. I'm sure by this point, the people are very curious about what's about to happen. Now we see clouds. Now we see dark sky. Man, it hasn't rained in three and a half years. This is amazing. All right, so, and it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and the wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and gird up his loins, and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. <laughs> now, there's a lot that we could discuss here, but I want you to notice this, because he tells him, you better get to your chariot because the rain's coming, there's clouds, and before they can probably get the words out of their mouth, the sky turns black, the wind starts to blow, and the rain starts to roll in. Hey, Ahab, you better get moving. So Ahab jumps in his chariot, if you can picture this, and he begins to take off and heads toward Jezreel. And the Bible says, and I kind of picture it as God kind of scooping him up a little bit. The hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he kind of gives him a little boost. And Elijah outruns Ahab's chariot. Can you picture this? Now, I don't know if he's running beside him. Or if he's running a different way. But yeah, hey, how you doing there? <laughs> and, and, you know, can you imagine Ahab's face when he gets to Jezreel and who's at the gate to meet him? But, a, but Elijah. Now, I believe this is on purpose because Ahab had to have a reminder. The rains are back. So the drought is over. But there's still a lot of work to do, Ahab. We still need to clean up this mess. And Elijah was standing at that gate when Ahab came through as kind of a slap in the face, if you will, to say, don't forget about me. I'm still here, buddy. God's still in control. I mean, how do you outrun a chariot? I mean, this is, this is impossible. Only God can do something like this. Now, we look at this and we think, oh, that's great. You know, the, the, the drought is done and the rains are back and now everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be wonderful. But, but, but wait, no rain for three and a half years. There's no vegetation in Israel. Do you remember when they started looking 
for grass just to feed the horses. What did they say? We have to find some grass just so we don't lose the horses. We've got to find anything we can get, right? This is how bad it was. Now, it doesn't mean that, boom, there's a drop of rain, there's a blade of grass. You know, it takes time to recover from this. And so even though the rains are back, there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of rebuilding that has to take place. And Elijah's standing at that gate as Ahab comes through just to say, remember, I'm still here. My God is still God. And everything that we've just experienced for three and a half years can very easily happen again. Just a reminder. Now, granted, the Bible doesn't say that's why he was there, but why else would he be there? Why would God send Elijah to the gate to meet Ahab at Jezreel? He wanted Ahab to remember how powerful God was because there's no way that Elijah could have beaten him there. But you remember when when he revealed himself, when he returned, and, and, and the prophet said, uh, no, if I go tell Ahab that you're here, then God's going to whisk you away and I won't be able to find you. See, they knew that the hand of God was upon Elijah's life and would move him in ways that they couldn't understand. So it's just a, just a little gesture, a little reminder to Ahab you're not really in control here. God is. And that's what we need to remember. No matter what comes into our lives, you know, when we have difficulties, we have trials, we have hardships, health issues, financial issues, you name it. When God answers that prayer and that hardship is over, there's still recovery. But God is still God. God is still good. God is still in control. We may be dealing with consequences. We may be dealing with results. We may be dealing with, with the leftovers sometimes that are e sometimes even as hard as the trial itself. But God is still God. God is still in control. And we need to understand that he's the one that brought us through this. And Elijah was a reminder to Ahab that this is what God has done. You had no, no say, you had no authority, you had nothing to do with this, Ahab. This has all been God, and don't you forget it. Well, we need that reminder. We need that reminder every day. You know, when you wake up in the morning and take that first breath, that's all God. I mean, I hate to trivialize it like that, but that's just the truth. Because if God says you don't get another breath, you can suck, wheeze, and huff and puff all you want. You're not getting any. <laughs> somewhere, God, somewhere somebody did not. True. I mean, if you woke up this morning and took a, a, a breath, and praise God for that because he allowed it. The other part of that miracle, besides um, Elijah getting to the outrunning the chariot, yeah. my, my footnote says that's about 17 <laughs> yeah, I, I can't run 17 feet without being winded. <laughs> so 17 miles, God just... Another miracle. I mean, you, you know, you can say what you will about how God did it. But regardless, God did it. And what an amazing God. For him to outrun this chariot and to be standing there at the gate, I mean, out. I don't, I don't know about you, but I kind of picture Elijah as this kind of, you know, in-your-face kind of guy, and he's standing at the gate going, mm-hmm, yeah. What took you so long? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I got a little drink for you, Ahab. Come on. You know, I mean, that's just, that, that's how I picture it. Maybe it didn't happen that way, but I'm sure Ahab, when he saw Elijah standing there, thought, man, this guy. He is such a thorn in my side. When will he ever leave me alone? Just a reminder. God's still there, Ahab. 
God's still there in our lives too, regardless of what's going on, regardless of what we're dealing with. God is always there and always ready when we are faithful. So now next week we're going to get our, our last lesson in the life of Elijah and uh, just a, a short little mini-series, I guess, if you will. And uh, just look at a few more things next week, and we'll wrap up Elijah and get moving on to some more of these topics. But uh, just, I mean, this is our first, first one, and I've enjoyed this already. So I look forward to getting some more of these topics in here. And, and uh, boy, Elijah's something else, isn't he? But wait till next week. Hmm, what will happen? <laughs> I think we know, but what will happen? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, again for this time. We thank you for examples like Elijah that we can see in Scripture, not only of your faithfulness, but of his faithfulness to you, an example to us to be faithful, and an example to us to trust you and to walk with you and to do what you've called us to do. Lord, we just pray that you continue to bless our lives and continue to help us as we serve you. Be with the service this morning. Be with pastor as he brings the message. May it be exactly what we need for our lives. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen.